At this place in history, we're in Derrico Center with Executive Director of the Vermont Historical Society, Steve Perkins. What are we chatting about today? So there's snow on the ground, yep. so I figured we should talk about Snowflake Bentley today. We've got a really special opportunity to talk with his great grandniece, wow. Sue Richardson. So she's going to meet us at the Snowflake Bentley exhibit and teach us all about her great grand uncle. <laughs> Sue, we all know him as Snowflake Bentley. What was his real name and what is your connection? His real name was Wilson Alwyn Bentley and he was my great great uncle. He was um, always from his very earliest age interested and fascinated by nature. He loved roaming the back hills, the fields, everything about nature including of course snowflakes. When he was uh, about 15 years old, his mother gave him a microscope that she had had from her days as a school teacher, and that really opened up a whole world to him. The first time he looked at a snow crystal under the microscope, he was captivated. For his 17th birthday, after much discussion and with the help of an inheritance from his maternal grandmother, his parents purchased this camera for him in 1882 cost $100, which was a tremendous amount of money when you consider that land was selling for about $6 an acre at that time. Whew. Now that doesn't look like any camera I've ever seen. It, it, there's been some modifications. Yeah? There have been, and that is the microscope that is mounted on the front of it. Oh. The microscope is what enabled the enlargement so that the, of the snow crystals so they could be photographed. You've probably all seen pictures of folks with these old bellows cameras standing behind them with the black cloth over their heads. Well, that would be a pretty long reach to try to focus that microscope from standing behind the camera. So Willie came up with this ingenious device. He mounted that round wooden disc with a smaller one inside of it, one on each side of the camera. He wrapped that string that you see around it, up through the eye hole, around the focus knob on the microscope, back through this side and wrapped in the opposite direction. So by standing behind it, he could turn those discs and focus the microscope. It took him two years of experimentation before he got his first successful photograph on January 15, 1885. A lot of creativity, a, a lot, lot of tenacity. <laughs> what did he do with those photographs then? It became his life's work. It became his life's passion. And he wanted to share that with the world. So he never charged people, only what it cost him, which was five cents for a negative five cents of print. Tiffany's, the famed New York jeweler, bought a set of his negatives for jewelry designs. <laughs> and he had them published in many newspapers, magazines. He wrote many, many articles and many different scientific magazines as well. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. My favorite two fields of study are kind of colliding here, mm -hmm. meteorology and history. What are the greater implications on, on science and meteorology of his work? He was very, very involved with the National Weather Service and with the American Meteorological Society when it was founded in 1919, he received the first grant ever given by the American Meteorological Society for $25 <laughs> in 1924 <laughs> in recognition of the importance of his work. The things that he discovered about snow crystals, how they form, are still true today. He kept very detailed weather records which were used to study weather patterns. He was truly ahead of his time. At this place in history, 